Good morning, and welcome to Longmont Startup Week. If you've joined us today for day one, and for the very first session of Longmont Startup Week, welcome. I hope you're excited, as excited as I am. We've got an amazing lineup of presenters, speakers, entrepreneurs, and business leaders from the local community. So we are in our seventh year, and every year we focus on one thing, providing those entrepreneurs, and innovators, investors, and business leaders of this community a forum to learn, to share, and to grow. This year is no different. I'm Dave Smith from Avisec Communications, and we are the producers of this year's Startup Week. Together with our team and local community leaders, we are incredibly proud to bring you this lineup of speakers and innovators. The challenge for the last year has been uh, an inspiration for the focus of this year's theme. We chose it because it acknowledged what was challenging in 2020 and hope for 2021 and what's around the corner. There is a different track every day and we want to make sure that when you tune in you're aware of the speakers that you'll hear and the message that they have. So today is refresh, it's focusing on innovation. Tuesday is recalibrate and that's focusing on operations. Wednesday is reimagine, reimagine and that's focusing on leadership. Thursday is redesign and that's focusing on creativity. Friday, we wrap up with Revitalize, and that's focusing on capital. So we hope you can join for some, or all, of the amazing content and lineup that we have. This morning, we have three amazing sessions for you. We have Maggie Civic from ARC Thrift Stores, who's going to talk about creating big impact with, uh, without a big budget. And we have Lori Jones and Jimmy Beretta talking to us about bold and brave marketing strategies. But let's start off Longmont Startup Week with our very first session, and that's going to be a fireside chat with Brandon Knudsen, founder of one of our favorite coffee shops here in Longmont, Ziggy's, and one of Longmont's most successful entrepreneurs. So Brandon is going to join us today and share some challenges, some wins, and some lessons learned through on-the-job innovation as he and his wife have grown a very successful business who also believes that exceptional customer service will always outlast the memory of a delicious drink. So a quick bio on Brandon. In 2004, he and Cameron opened the first Ziggy's Coffee location on the corner of 4th and Main Street, which is just about two and a half blocks from us and one block from where I work. And I visit that place three days a week religiously. For them, coffee has always been more than just a beverage. Brandon and Cameron associate coffee with fellowship and they see it as a way to connect with customers. The belief is that the basis for Ziggy's commitment to providing excellent service and support for the communities are part of an everyday lifestyle. As of today, Ziggy's has expanded across Colorado and the U.S. and I learned this morning opening up shortly in Connecticut and they have locations that are staples for their communities. These coffee shop industry veterans will thrive as a part of a bigger day-to-day -day commitment that we all make to be better at what we do and to be committed to be the best we can be. And they find joy in mentoring their franchisees, their managers, and the staff that they have to become great business leaders for tomorrow. So Brandon, thank you very much for joining us. We, we really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. So you and Cameron started this business um, a while ago. In 2004, you opened up the first shop here on the corner. I would love for you to tell me a little bit about what inspired you to move from bring, being an employee to an entrepreneur and the really interesting road that followed. Yeah, so, you know, that, that kind of started back in college. My, my wife and I both, uh, we have parents that are entrepreneurs, and I, I don't think we really thought about it consciously going into school. We were really focused on sports and just, you know, being a, a young married couple. But uh, as we went through school and, 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 and uh, my wife got a job as a CNA, just seeing what it was like to work for someone else. And then uh, on my way through school, I worked at graveyards and ice cream plants. Worked really, really hard. and just didn't feel like that hard work was really appreciated. I feel like I was, I just sat there and I, and I did a really good job. I was making them money. And uh, I think I knew at that point that, that I needed to do that for me. And when I worked really hard, I wanted to see the, the benefits of that. Uh, and not just in a paycheck, I wanted to grow it. So, um, you know, she got a job uh, at a, at a drive through coffee shop uh, and uh, was making killer money, 100 bucks a day in tips, and this was 20-something years ago, so it was really good money. And I think just the, the light went off and said, we, we could do this. Um, 
and we pretty much shut down everything. We dropped out of school after my last basketball game. Like we were going to open a drive through coffee shop. That was it. And uh, kind of start the wheels in motion. And you met Cameron while you were in school. Yeah, so I was on the five-year junior college plan, okay. uh, which I'm pretty proud of, actually. <laughs> Had I not done that, I would have met her because she's about four years younger than I am. And uh, we were both on the basketball team. I was on the men's team, some of the women's team. And uh, not a lot of beautiful basketball players come through uh, Eureka, California. So it was, uh, it was definitely meant to be. And did that uh, commitment to sports and the drive that you had to have as an athlete, do you think that, could, that contributed to the success that you both have had as entrepreneurs working together? There's, there's no question. I think, especially basketball is such a team sport, and uh, and uh, I was always the point guard, which is the leader of the team, you know. And uh, I think, and she was the point guard of the women's team. So I both think we had that in us, and we knew that if you didn't lift up your 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 uh, your teammates, you're, you're never going to win. And I, I think that was really not something we went into business saying, okay, this is going to be just like sports. But certainly, certainly, it was ingrained in us from that. You told me in our visit earlier that um, you're really a hands-on leader. When I asked you to describe your kind of leadership style, you described, you know. Um, being hands-on, boots on the ground, that kind of guy that will walk in and kind of assess all the different personalities of the staff that you have and finding the best fit. Tell the audience a little bit more about that philosophy and how you think that's grown to, um, to be so successful with the teams that you have across the country now. Yeah, I think well, it started with, with doing it ourselves first, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, we, when we opened, we, we were the only employees. Mm -hmm. we, we had to clean the bathroom, we had to pay the bills, we had to make the coffee, we had to get the early stay late, those sort of things. So I think having done it, the employees can see through that if you're just barking orders or if you really know what you're talking about. So in order to really lead, you've got to kind of know that space. And so I think that that's really important today, where even, even now we have a new store opening with a different drive through model, for example, like a Wiling drive through I'll go and hang out because I want to see how it works. I want to see how it functions. I want to see how the team does. And, and anything new, I want to be really involved with. So I'm not sitting behind a desk just barking orders. Um, as you've grown the business and you found the perfect employee profile, uh, I'm sure that there are things that you look for, both for the, the front of store as well as kind of behind the scenes. If, if you are able to describe like the perfect employee, because I'm going to ask you a little bit about your franchisee model in a moment, mm -hmm. but what does the perfect employee look like uh, for, for Aziz? Yeah, the perfect employee, uh, he, this person has to care, mm -hmm. right? There's to be buy-in. I think the employees uh, that really do well with us seem to really care about what they're doing. They want to do it for them, mm -hmm. you know, and also, you know, eventually we establish a relationship and then they want to do it for us. Right. If they're just doing it for a paycheck, uh, I think that's going to be a short, short lived relationship. Right. So that's the why. I love the history of the brand. I think it's important for um, the local community to recognize that you guys started from ground zero mm -hmm. and have grown it uh, tremendously along the way. And we'll talk about this more later. You've, um, you've joined forces with a lot of mentors and local leaders that have helped you along the way, which is a great story in and of itself. Yeah. But now things are on. The, the stores are growing. I mean, you've got multiple franchises. You've got new businesses coming you know, to, to fruition every single day. Um, we talked a little bit about Connecticut earlier, but mm -hmm. tell me about the first franchise that you and Cameron decided was the next best phase of the business and how that's grown since then. Well, um, you know, our, our first franchise, you know, when we, we started this franchise company, we, we were, we actually go back, we actually did a license deal before we got a new franchise. We wanted to see what this was like, right? We'd spent a lot of time really teaching our managers, treating them like franchisees. Mm -hmm. And so we knew we weren't just going to jump into franchising because just being a leader for another business owner is just not something that had done. And so we're like, what's the, the closest thing we can do to that? So we did this, said, okay, managers, you're doing your own hiring you're doing your own firing, you're going to create your schedule, you're going to do deposits, you're going to be like a franchisee. We did it for years trying to sort this out. Then we brought on someone that we did a license agreement with, we learned a lot from that. That's okay, here's, they kind of helped us identify what's that franchisee that we're looking for and how can we make sure we're providing enough resources to, to be a great franchisor. And so we found a young couple that was just raring and ready to go, uh, the Andersons uh, at a Loveland, young family, and they've just been incredible. Uh, they were our, our first franchisee. Yep. And uh, they, they put in the hours, uh, 
they're, they're, they're great stores of the brand. Um, believe it or not, they're actually signed deal number 100 with us as well. They have, they have five, uh, four locations open. They're working on a fifth right now. All in northern Colorado? Uh, they actually have one in Castle Pines with a sister and then the okay. rest up north, but yeah. So if I'm a new franchisee candidate and I get a chance to come to you and give you my story and why I think it's a great idea for us to partner, and you ask me, hey Dave, what's, what's the first thing that you do if you're gonna open up a store in, you know, in West Greeley? And I give you three ideas that are completely outside the box. Are you gonna look at me and say, Dave, I love the fact that you are just, you know, you're, you're looking outside the box and you're creative, or are you gonna say, that's not what you built the business on? No, so I would tell that person that you should definitely go start your own company and go get it in, in a very positive way, not, sure. not, not a negative way. Uh, as a franchisee, we need someone that's going to be a uh, system follower. I hate to say rule follower, but I mean, in order to protect everyone else, we have to be very particular on on how we how our processes are implemented. And there's a system followed. in place for a reason. There's a system in place for a reason. So we're not looking for not, I want to say entrepreneurial, but but we're looking for people that are that are going to work really hard, that are going to treat their employees really, really, really well, and uh, but. But those that, that have great ideas and, and want to innovate, we would kind of push them in a little bit different direction. Understood. Yeah. Understood. So as you build the business and you expand your footprint, you obviously have to think of what's around the corner. You know, innovation is the, the theme of today and one of the reasons that we wanted you to be part of this because you've innovated all along the way. Uh, drink recipes, store models, locations, different business models. Um, tell me about, tell us about one of the most uh, recent uh, innovations in your business model that kind of is uh, new to 2021 and is a byproduct of the last year that we've experienced. Yeah, one of the ones I'm really excited about is uh, obviously we're drive through company, you know, and uh, uh, fitting drive throughs on small properties has been a challenge. Uh, I think, you know, we've really been watching Chick fil A and how they've fit, you know, 3,000 cars on, a, on two acres is pretty pretty impressive what they can do. So we've come up with some interesting ways of, of taking orders ahead with iPads, things like that. One of the things we're really excited about is we're uh, in Tempe, Arizona, we're going to open a store really close to the ASU campus. And uh, we're going to do a, uh, there's no drive through available there. The students live above it. Uh, it's kind of their walk to school. So we're going to put a walk-up window on an inline space, which would have, which is challenging in itself. In, creating the counters and the things inside so that the baristas are close, you know, that sort of thing, to that walk-up window. Uh, that should launch here in the next probably five months. We should be open. And just one of those things that we're just trying to evolve and keep up with, you know, people are much more comfortable with drive throughs and walk-ups, I think, at this moment uh, still. And so we want to be prepared for that. When you come up with an idea like that, say it's at your quarterly meetings, um, I'm sure there's a few other things that I'd love to chat about um, as far as ideas that are um, outcomes from those meetings, but is that a committee type of experience? Is that Brandon and Cameron saying, I, I think we should try this and go to market with the 80% solution and adjust along the way? Or is it carefully vetted? Are you looking at numbers and data? Mm -hmm. And kind of how does, because that's a big you know, expense in you know, floor space and, you know, um, and construction, marketing. How, did, how does that all come to fruition when you finally say, this is what we should do? We've got a great team. We've got about a dozen people that work out of kind of our home office at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, from marketing to operations, you know, our operations team, you know, we have two people, Nikki Rivera and, and Danny Warner. Nikki's been with us for 16 years. She was, was six months after we opened, she started working for us. And so she's in the field every day. And then Danny's been working for about 12 years. And so anything that we think about implementing, we bounce it off them first. Right? So how would this work in the store? Then we have a great, my wife works very closely with the architecture firm, and we say, how can we lay this out? Can this actually fit? And then we go to our marketing team and say, can you sell this for us? And that's just our processing on each one. And then we go to franchisees and say, hey, this is a little bit new. Are you comfortable with us, you know, trying something new with you? And then we always, you know, if it's something outside of what we've done, we, I usually put up a little extra money to, to help it. I'll buy that window. I'll do some things to say, look, we're in this together. Right. And, uh, and that's been pretty successful so far. That's great to hear. I love how open you are to new ideas, and I'm sure the, the yeah. franchisees appreciate that. Absolutely. So the logistics are increasing on a daily with all the new stores that are opening up. You're working from your, your home office, which is literally your home office, right? Literally my home office. And in me now, there there's a, a big, beautiful building that is taking shape. Mm -hmm. How did you arrive at the point where you knew that you needed a corporate office? And 
why did you decide that Meek was the place to do it? So the cool thing about franchising is you got a year and a year and a half lead time before a store opens, and the real work begins, right? So you sell a store, and now that the, the process is finding the location, the operations team, the, the trainers, all those things doesn't happen for a year, year and a half. So we sold 40 units last year, I think, and once we started selling at that pace, we knew we were going to get to the point where we, gonna, we were going to need more support for these guys to get them open. So that was, it was pretty easy to decide, like, we need space. As far as the space itself, you know, we, we, we were going to rent some spaces out. We actually looked in Longmont at some different rental spaces, but, but I'm, I'm a big, and Longmont's my home too, don't get me wrong. I think Mead is just an extension of Longmont, honestly. Um, but, but Mead has been so good. Mead Elementary, Mead Middle, the high school has been so good to my son and my family. We just felt like, hey, we can build this building that we need, and we can also have a, make a huge impact on the town of Mead. And we're going in the heart of four-way stop right by the school. And I think by us going there, not only can we you know, create some revenues for the town, but we can create jobs for, for a lot of people in this town. We'll probably hire 25 baristas for that store. Um, but I think other businesses will come and see us that he's there, I hope, and then they'll follow suit and start building out and creating the amenities that I think everybody in Mead needs. So for the, the audience that's listening, and maybe there's um, entrepreneurs you know, to be in the making, maybe there's some mature businesses uh, that are looking for ideas and insights from people who have been there and done that. When you think about making capital investments like you have in that building, where, walk us through that, that process where you, you're you looking at what could be as a result of the money spent today because I know that has to be, that has to weigh heavily on your mind with things popping up all over the rest of the country, right? Yeah, I think, um, and we've been doing this a long time this way. We. I think probably the opening on 66 would have been a better place for the business, mm -hmm. per se, maybe even more convenient, even for some of the employees that are commuting. But what we found is that if, if our heart is in the right place for the investment, and, and, and we truly are trying to make an impact in the community, uh, you, you're creating kind of some grace with your, your customers as well. Like, they're all in on you, right? right. When, it, when we used to be, when we were in downtown Longmont, and we had some math, math, we had one year, I think it had a snowstorm every Friday for like a month and a half. And that's when we do all of our business back. I couldn't afford to miss 200 bucks in sales, right? right? But it snowed. Our customers would walk three blocks, four right. blocks from their house downtown. No, they didn't need the coffee. They wanted to make sure that we were okay. Mm -hmm. And so I think something similar is going to happen here in me uh, because I think we're doing the right thing for the town. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of grace if we blow it sometimes if we don't give, you know, the drink right or the service isn't perfect. I think that, that we're in it together. So I think if you take that approach with business and you, 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 you try to affect the community first, the long term is, is, it may be a long term play, but I think you'll see the benefits. I love that. So you, you said uh, a moment ago, um, when we talked a, a few weeks ago, you mentioned it no, less than five times, which was inspiring to me, but you, you said all in. When I, when I asked you, like, hey, it, when, we, when we end up talking, you know, on the 26th, I want to kind of center around a theme mm -hmm. to your success as well as kind of the way that you give advice and inspiration to your kids your employees, people who come to you with questions or uh, concerns about their own business. And you said, Dave, when we decide to do something, we do it all in. And you gave me an analogy about your son, your oldest son's you know, training and positioning. And you can, you can give a little love to the, the commitment that he has and mm -hmm. what's happening next in his world. But being all in, it means something to you, mm -hmm. right? Tell me about how that type of commitment has helped bridge those tough periods of uh, being a business owner and an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if tapping out is an option, you're always going to tap out mm -hmm. because it's hard. You know, we, we went through stretches where, you know, not really embarrassed to me. I mean, there's times when I had to sit down with City Long with sales tax and be like, I, I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. I could close, but like, will you work with me? Like, can I pay you $20 a month for sales tax? This is the first couple of years. And they're like, of course. Like, People will work with you if you're willing to, to, to keep moving forward. You know, I, I can remember multiple times you'd finally make a little bit of progress and then the express machine break. So I'd go borrow 20 grand at 24% interest and we'd go in again. Because we were all in. We were, we were going to do this no matter what, no matter what the debt wrapped up, those sort of things. We had a vision and we were going to get there. Now, the sales were trending in the right direction, which helped. I think if you're in a business, the sales going down, I don't know if I keep chasing it with more money. But at the end of the day, Quitting was not an option, you know, and, and you know, I talked about my son and you know, we, he said like, I want to be a basketball player, I want to play college basketball. Well, you're, 
you know, at the time a five foot four, not very athletic kid, are you sure you want to do this? He's like, well, here's what it's going to take. Uh, I even hired him uh, at one of our stores, and uh, he tells everybody this day that it, you know, his dad fired him. But he's working, he's made good cash at the Firestone store, but he wasn't putting time into basketball. I'm like, you're not all in right now. I know you want to go with this, but you're going to put your six, eight hours of basketball in and weights, things like that. And, you know, I'm excited to see his dad proud. He got a you know, full ride scholarship to Colorado Mesa, which, so it paid off for him. But at the end of the day, it was, it was what he was going to do, and he's going to do whatever it took to get there. Well, that, that mindset, I think, is probably part of my interest in this next part of the conversation, which is the beginning of COVID. You are doing great. Stores are performing. You know, profits are looking great. Your employees are happy. Mm -hmm. Franchisees are coming to the door. And then everybody knows what's next. And that all-in mindset, I think, helped bridge a lot of new challenges for you and the community. So I mentioned earlier that you're very involved in the community. You leaned on a lot of mentors over, the, over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those individuals came back to you with, um, with some questions. I would love, and I think the rest of the audience would as well, love to hear about some of the advice that you gave your constituents uh, that helped bridge you know, a couple of rough months. Yeah, so you know, it, it started with the conversation with the, the LDDA. You know, when this thing started, you know, going south, and we realized there were some some big challenges. So we we, we created a, a group, you know, that we would jump on of uh, downtown business owners, and uh, you know, everyone really. There a lot of people brought a lot of really amazing knowledge to the table. Um, I had a great banking relationship. But actually, they're on your 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 uh, the startup week, uh, Chris over at High Plains mm -hmm. and John. They were amazing. So. Because we're doing so many deals and finance at the point, I had a really strong relationship with those guys. And so we kind of leveraged that relationship and the, and the knowledge that they had with the SBA and to get it out ahead of the PPP, which was incredible for everybody, and also the EIDL loans. And so I was able to share the information of how to go fill it out, um, what time of day to fill it out, because the systems were all bogged down. And, uh, and then also just trying to bring some, some positive to it, you know, that, that uh, you know, again, all in, you, it doesn't matter. Like, all right, we just gotta, here's our next challenge. You know, we're, we're gonna attack it, we're gonna fix it. And the other thing was just to take it day by day, you know, moment by moment, honestly. You know, things changed. You get a call from a store and, you know, everyone did some business or, you know, we have a case of COVID, you know, what are we gonna do now? And you just gotta be, you gotta be prepared, you gotta be ready to problem solve and stay positive and we all come through it. I imagine as an athlete, you have some, some views on running a business that are akin to like, our playbook, right? And how has your playbook changed going into 2021 as a result of the last year? What are some of the things that you and Cameron have um, penciled in, things that you have penned in, and others that you have you've carved into the business model? What, what, what does that look like? Yeah, I think with the, the, you know, we always have been focused on our employees, uh, but I think we've gotten sharper with it mm -hmm. because with the pandemic, it's, it's, it was so tough for for the staff, right? We always, you know, feel sorry for ourselves as 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 owners, but at the end of the day, those are the ones in there. With early on, we didn't really know what this was, and so I think it just took us to another level with being in tune with our staff and what they needed. Um, hey, you don't feel good? Just we'll, we'll pay for it. We just go home and like do your thing. And so I think we've implemented a lot of new things of, of really, really paying closer attention to them mm -hmm. even more than we were before. When uh when that period happened, there was probably some some reflection on did we plan correctly? What happens next? And when this when we come out of all this, what are we going to do differently? Have there been new approaches to uh, different types of drink recipes or service models like that have been completely driven by the past few months? And if so, mm -hmm. what? How did that unfold at your? I, I assume this happens at quarterly. Uh, meetings where all the, the meetings of the minds come together and you, you talk about what's next. Yeah, I mean, we meet we meet every Monday, 9 to 10. Okay. I'm actually missing it today. We're going to move it a little bit later. He'll, he'll be a little late. I'll be a little late. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they're having fun with this today in the office. But, uh, no, we, we meet every day. We're always discussing. Anybody that has anything, we throw it on the table. Kind of your stand-up meeting every, every Monday. Um, you know, really expedited some things that we wanted to do. You know, we have a punch card system for loyalty right now, which is a little outdated, but it's been popular for us. But the, the, the contactless payment thing was something we, we wanted to do, but it was expensive, and you just kind of get in a groove and things are working the way that they're working. 
So uh, we've really, we're getting ready to launch our app here in the next probably two months. Okay. Um, it's all contactless payment, it's order ahead, it's all these really cool features that, that I think this port kind of gasoline on that and got our team really moving. And when you come up with ideas like that with the team and pick your favorite new recipe in the last 12 months, what look at that, what is that? Oh my gosh, um, the, the Red Bulls have been, you know, I don't know if I can pick a single one, but the Red Bull infusions have been, uh, yeah, you know, it's Red Bull and, 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 you know, with flavored syrup and it's not super complicated, but uh, those have been my kind of my afternoon go-to. And, and with the pandemic, you know, the afternoons that you didn't used to be that busy, you couldn't go anywhere else. And so it really picked it up. So we were kind of forced or able to really develop that, that afternoon cold drink menu. So I don't know if there's one particular that I fell in love with, but just those drinks have been a lot of fun for us. So Fourth of July just happened, and you had a firecracker drink. <laughs> That's true. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> so who who came up with that, and <clears throat> and how long did it take for that to end up being in the store? Yeah. So Danny Waters, our you know, she I mentioned her earlier. She's been with us over mm -hmm. twelve years. She's you know, amongst a million other things, she's in charge of product development. Okay. So. You know, we'll kind of look at it. We'll look at a time frame. Okay, fall's coming. You know, the the obviously the Fourth of July was coming. What we want to, how can we really use the the ingredients we have, but come up with still a fun drink? So that's her goal is always either highlight a drink that we already have, or come up with something with as many ingredients we already have that would be kind of fun, kind of like LTL limited time. And and she had the idea to to order some 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 pop rocks. And like it just seemed like a perfect Fourth of July. I don't want to do with this, but I'm gonna order some food coloring, some pop rocks. And so she should, just had a blast with it. And it was probably four months in, the, in, in planning. And uh, so, she, so she came up with the idea, went to, to my wife, who has to sign up and everything, she's the big boss, and loved it. And the marketing team, of course, like, come on, you know, it's just easy ammunition for them. Right. And it was a huge, huge hit. We yeah. sold thousands and thousands and thousands. We had, uh, I think, maybe 750,000 impressions on social media between influencers, wow. things like that. So it was a huge hit. Tell us about social media and how that has helped you locally and nationally, and is there a particular strategy that you've uh, you've crafted and then perfected over the last few years? Yeah, so it's funny, I, I love that you asked that because I was a non, I was an anti-marketing guy mm -hmm. until about six years ago, and uh, I was cheap. You know, I just, I didn't feel like any, I said, we're right here on the corner and people drive by and they didn't see my cheap. building. You were very efficient. I was very efficient, thank you for that, I was really cheap. And, uh, uh, one of my former basketball players actually talked me into hiring his wife as just very part-time, you know, a couple hours a week in marketing, and, and she's our director of marketing to this day. She does an incredible job. So, you know, she, social media is so easy and it's so cost-effective way to just get your brain out there, just to remind folks that you're there. And as far as LTOs with limited time offers, things like that, you know, for a few hundred bucks on market, you can really get the word out there. And so she's done, our whole team's done a great job with that. And then we're really moving towards, and I'm, we're still feeling this out, but it went really well in the last campaign, is, is um, influencers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have a hard time, I'm old school, I, I struggle that you know, people get paid to do that, but they do, and it, it really matters. They do. And so, and that's how we got to own that three quarter of a million uh, impressions was with, through influencers and going out to take a picture. So you're gonna see a lot of our, our uh, external marketing going in that direction. Well, I love that you mentioned that because our, our next speaker, Maggie Civic, who's the VP of Marketing at Arc Thrift Stores, is going to talk about making a big impact uh, without a big budget mm -hmm. and social is a big part of that mm -hmm. and being that uh, you were so efficient at what you uh, <laughs> Thank what you. you spent money on mm -hmm. um, and the way that you did it is is very inspiring I think mm -hmm. to a lot of our a lot of our local um, entrepreneurs to be as well as business owners um, I think it's important that they recognize there are other ways to reach a large audience uh, in a short period of time and being very impactful along the way. So if if there are three takeaways that you could share with um, the audience out there today around being smart about your marketing dollars, you, I'll give you one, which is embrace social media. Embrace social media. Two other things that you've learned along the way and maybe, maybe a fourth where you never want to do this. So on social, I think, um, Having people to understand or taking courses on how it works. Mm -hmm. Going to, it's really easy to go put up a post and put hundred dollars behind it and and maybe get a lot of likes, sure. but it's it's fake likes. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't help you, right? Really understanding how to target and how to use that money wisely and how you spread I mean our team and I'll be honest, I don't completely understand how it works and 
I don't need to because they're really good at it. Just understanding how to spread it over three or four hours or, or the hours in the day that you think people are really going to see it. There's, you can get so micro in social, uh, but you have to understand. So either you hire someone really good to do it or take the courses and, and, and learn how to do that. Um, and then I think from a social standpoint, something I learned really early is as the owner of the business, um, I, I take my brand very seriously. My company, uh, I have a lot of passion there. Um, I can't comment on things on social media. I need a bear, I need like a, um, you need a buffer. I need a buffer mm -hmm. because I get offended when people say stuff about my employees or about the sure. shakes, things like that. I, you know, how would you not? We put, you know, 17 years of our life into this. So having somebody else respond for you that's not emotional about it, it is a, is a huge, huge factor. And we, we've made a lot of progress because we've done that. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Um, you know, the next thing I'd love to talk to you about is uh, around pivoting. And there have been, uh, again, probably you know, in, in the realm of athletic conversation and you know, positioning uh, with how you run the business, how you run your life, how you run a game, are there points within uh, your, your recent past where you've pivoted on the direction the business is going in order to maintain a great trajectory? Is, is that on the number of franchisees you're interviewing? Because I saw your board and you have big numbers up there. Mm -hmm. You told me when I asked uh, about the plan, you said, Dave, I had a direction that I was going, but I never set a certain number of how many stores we wanted or you know, different states we were going to be in. Was there a point in time where you pivoted and said, this is the direction that we need to go because it's going to be the best for our future? Well, I think you know, going from corporate owned or you know, owned stores, my own own owned to franchising was a huge pivot for us because we knew we wanted to grow it, but it's very capital intensive. And, and again, to to really have that culture in the store, it's hard to have a hundred stores that you own and then still get to know your employees and do a great job. Does that freak you out to think that seventeen years later you've got potentially hundreds of different locations across multiple states? with families that rely on you for their business success, the future of their children. There's a lot of weight on your shoulders. How do you manage that? Until just now, I was fine. <laughs> no one's really brought it up like that. It's happened so organic. It's happened so slow and so organically. And, and, and you started with one, and we spent seven months getting that store ready. And then we and all of a sudden, two and three. And the, the, we've scaled really nicely. Not intentionally. It's just the way that it's worked out. Smoother um, than you thought? It's been really smooth. Yeah. yeah and I didn't know what, I mean, if you would ask me three years ago and we had you know, 20 stores open total right now, I'd be thrilled. You know, even 15, I'd be thrilled. Um, so, you know, until you sit there and really reflect on it like that, you think about that, that's pretty intense. But on the day to day, we have such an amazing team. And as we add stores, we add more, we have, uh, you know, coaches, uh, sure. basically we call them, that have direct contact with managers and stores. and. And they're amazing, uh, and so we just have a good team. And every time we sell another, you know, ten or fifteen deals, we, we hire another team member that, that comes in. And so it doesn't feel in the moment that overwhelming. That's great to hear. And, yeah. And and I teed that up because when I asked you, your answer was it was just incredibly humble. You're like, to me, it's incredible to think that we've grown this large, have come this far, and along the way, we've been surrounded by you and Cameron, by great people. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, people that you trusted, your circle of friends. I mean, you have employees that have been with you, you know, almost 20 years. That speaks volumes of the leadership that you two provide. But along the way, I'll bet there were people that tried to pressure you. Because you mentioned, Dave, I don't like to make choices when I'm pressed because sometimes they're not the best. Can you tell me about those? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, growth has to happen. It's gotta be, you gotta be really careful, you know, and, and people ask me, what is your goal for the number of stores you want to open? What, what do you want to, what's your goal for five years? I, I don't have any, and I don't want to sound like I'm not preparing myself and being a good business owner, and some people may say that's crazy, but I think as soon as you set a, a number for yourself, say I want to open 40 stores next year, now you're pushing and pressing, as you said, to get those stores open. I think that's when you make mistakes. Right. I think you know our whole business model is surrounded by, if we, if we can bring out awesome people that, that share similar uh, traits to us uh, that will treat their employees like gold uh, and and follow our process, then that's going to dictate our growth. And like we talked about earlier, the cool thing about franchising on this side of it is you have this year lead time of bringing in more support as you sell. Right. So if we sell another 50 stores this year, I'm not worried about it. Right. You know, so so 
I think that's the, the, the number one way to approach that is just be prepared, don't overset goals so you're pressing, you're making bad choices, you're reaching, mm -hmm. um, and I think you'll be good. Okay. So you mentioned franchisees to be as you build the business. If there are 15 potential franchisees watching right now, mm -hmm. if you looked into that camera and said, here's the one thing that I would share with you that would make you successful, regardless if it's with Ziggy's or with someone else, what would that advice be? Ooh, that's a that's a that's a really good question. Um, well, first of all, if you're gonna do it. You gotta go all in, like we talked about, mm -hmm. right? Uh, y you need to take the time to understand the full scope of the business, sure. right? You understand, need to understand important benchmarks. You need to understand that you are gonna be working 60, 70 hours a week on this business, uh, and you need to make sure that you are are capitalized, you know, in, in a way that you can. When things go south, and they do go south, and when things cost, uh, you know, fifty percent more than they're supposed to, and they do, are you prepared for that? Where, where, where's the well that you're going to go to uh, when things get tough? Sure. So just being prepared on those things. So you doesn't have to be caught, whatever industry it is. Do your homework. There's the cool thing about now is, and it wasn't when I first started the podcasts. Yeah. Like are incredible. Like go find your industry and listen to ten people that talk about their story, Absolutely. where they had challenges, and understand how they overcame them. The, 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 the blueprint's already there, right. so. Absolutely. Um, as you build the business and bring new employees, new franchisees in, you form new partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're working with Coda Coffee for the last many years, right? Since, yeah, since the beginning, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And others that uh, come uh, as, as part of different packages in different states. You, I think, tend to reward great service with great commitment. Um, yep. And I think it would be great for business leaders to be and those that are out there today that are suddenly faced with new opportunities to um, extend their employee numbers locally, nationally, to, um, to consider like how you treat people who are dedicated and committed to you. So what are some of the things that you and Cameron have learned over the years as far as recognizing great service and, and how do you do that? Yeah, when it comes to, you know, kind of your employees or even your vendors, you know, it's it's understanding. So if you stay with employees, understanding what, what's important to them, you know, I think that's 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 easily the most important thing for me is, you know, I have employees that work on our corporate team on the leadership side that could care less about a raise. They just want a long weekend, right? Or they just want to get off early to go watch their kid play sports or, you know, a concert or something like that. So if you're in tuned, then you're going to get incredible loyalty from them. Some people do. They're young and they're trying to buy a house and they want, they'll work all weekend, but they want extra money. So I think recognizing that early on, and again, if you have that personal connection, that personal buy-in from them, they will go to the ends. And they, they may not be as talented. You may look at a resume. I hired, I don't hire off resumes. Like they have to be able to work on a computer and do some things. I want to meet them. I want to see if they're going to fit in with our family and I can trust the person they're going to care about us. I've, I haven't lost a corporate person since we started this six years ago, and then obviously we've lost other baristas, things like that, but on the corporate team, because I think we really care about them. We, we, we take them to Mexico, we go hang out, we, we do make it personal with them, and, and I think that's been really successful for us. Um, when, when you have the opportunity, you're sitting on a plane, you're on your way to Mexico, and somebody says, hey, what do you do? How do you, how do you, how do you tell somebody what, what you do for work? I don't like to talk about it, mm -hmm. so I don't. I just say I'm in the coffee business, honestly. Yeah. You know, and people press a little bit and, and say, but I. So what if the, yeah. what if the person behind <laughs> them says, that's the Ziggy guy, and they say, all right, Brandon, tell me something about you as an individual that would help me be a better leader. Um, what, what is it that you might tell that person? Yeah, it's, you know, super cliche, but, you know, I think, you know, your actions are everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing that's, that it's important, most important thing to me in business, and, and anybody that works with me or works for me knows that, that I, I put family first. I've never missed a practice, the game, I, we, you know, we're opening, you know, I think, you know, 20 more stores this year, and I've traveled every weekend for basketball to see my son and, and getting buried in work. But at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. And recognize that if, employee, if you want a day off from me, an employee, just come to me and say it's something for your kid or something for your family, and you just go. So I, I think that has been 
why we get so much buy-in from everybody, and that's and the same with the franchisees. If they call and they need me, I'm, I'm there for them. I'll, I'll talk to them through the through the hard, you know, whatever they're going through. It's very personal for me, right. and so um, the numbers. I was at the numbers last, but you'll make money if you'll do this, this, and this. But don't focus on that. Focus on your relationships. Focus on um, being true to your staff. And then I try to I try to do that every day. And I think again, it's a long term approach. You maybe be, look at my books and say, you know, you could make so much more money if you cut this, this, and this. Right. I don't really care, right? Because we're we're doing fine. And I love what we do every day. You care, but you have a perspective, and that is life is short, the kids will grow up, yep. they'll have memories of what dad and mom did or didn't do, mm -hmm. and if their choices influenced you know, the individuals that they are. And I think part of your, your mantra you're saying is the best part of your day, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if you make every experience the best part of your day, well, you've got great days to look forward to. Exactly. Yeah, and that's... That's kind of how we, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, it's a trickle down kind of effect, if you will, because if we treat our employees that way, the goal is, all right, now when that customer pulls out, you know, you know, drives through whatever, kind of try to read them, mm -hmm. right? Try to read, and this could be in any, any business, you get on the phone with somebody trying to sell something, like, what is it they need today to, to feel good, to be kind of the best part of their day, whether it's talking about, you know, their dog or whatever it is, or, you know, like we always say, like, you know, Grumpy Joe shows up, just shut up and make the coffee. Like, don't, you don't need to bother that. You can tell that guy doesn't want to talk. Sure. He just wants his coffee. The next person may want to talk for, you know, 12 minutes about, you know, their, their trip. Right. So we want to be the best part of their day. And that's been pretty successful for us, but hard to teach young people how to do. And you can only teach it by showing them you know, with, with, your, with your actions. Sure. Yep. I'm going to ask you one more question, but sure. before I do, we have Q&A open, so if you're interested in asking a question of Brandon and the business, um, let her rip and uh, we'll do our best to answer those. So with all of these stores and all these employees, there has to be one or two amazing stories about those individuals helping your customers make it the best part of their day. Uh, does anything bubble up over the past many years about somebody that either shared with you directly or one of your employees the, how that type of interaction with the people that you've hired had just it made a difference for them? Yeah, I don't know if anything one stands out. I, I think one of the fun things, even when I was a barista, is, is, is finding somebody that you could tell is just having a rough time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I won't say fix it, but like typically people, I know you said you come three days a week, we're pushing for five, I think we can get you there. Uh, typically, people come five days a week, and you can see it on their face. They're just they're just struggling. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we've been able to just create in these incredible relationships. And people have said, come back and said, look, we we we've been this rough, this rough period, and coming into Ziggy's and just spending time with you, even in a drive-through, just saying hi and checking on you, you can have a massive impact on people. So I, I think that's probably. You know, I, I can't think of a particular story. Monday, that, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on the Tuesdays. Where are you on Tuesdays and Thursdays? I don't. We'll work on that. I know you'll work on that. We'll work on I'm, that. I'm here for it. <laughs> no, that's great. I appreciate that. Yep. Um, we're going to wrap it up okay. and, uh, and talk a little bit about what the rest of the week looks like. We have Q&A that's opened. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please ask. Um, we're happy to either answer here or follow up. But is there one thing that um, you'd like to leave us with, Brandon, as far as uh, this local business, your commitment to the community, and things that you'd like to see moving forward with people who are you know, just starting their business? Well, first of all, I think Longmont has been like so good to us, better than we deserve. You know, we go back and, uh, you know, so, some folks in the Chamber of Commerce really put their arms around me early on, you know, when we were really struggling. Uh, Rick Sampson, one that comes to mind. And, uh, you know, opening business in Longmont, if you'll get plugged in, like I said, the Chamber's always been good. I know there's other groups, but, but, but it's very supportive. And uh, and so I think I think leaning on those resources is, is really really huge. Um, you need even to even to this day I still you know Cameron Grant is a is a huge part of my life as far as someone that I go to when I don't know the answer and it happens a lot. Um, but but and I'm I'm uh, I'm humble enough to say look you know I don't know what to do here and you got to walk me through this and he may say I don't know either but I'm going to find out from somebody. So this town is really really special in that way that it's it is a true community. And so if you will get involved, you'll ask people and you'll get outside of yourself a little bit and be okay with having somebody help you, I think you'll have a lot more success. 
I think those are wise words. Um, recognizing that you're uh, you're a humble guy and uh, obviously a very successful leader. Putting those two together, I think, helps you be uh, more approachable and share those type of life lessons with others that are aspiring to, um, you know, learn more about running their own business, improving the business that they have, or being a mentor to others. Um, so thank you again for all the time and the, and the great conversation. Appreciate we, you. We in this Longmont community appreciate you. Thank you, thank you so much. You bet. Well, I am going to uh, wrap this session up. I want to give you a little preview of what we have coming up. Uh, Maggie Civic, the VP of Marketing uh, at Art Thrift Stores is going to be up next, talking to us about hot chicken, pizza, and police citations. And if it sounds interesting, it really is, so you'll have to tune in there. I need to give a big shout out to our sponsors, uh, Art Thrift Stores, Avocet Communications, Ward Electric, Biz West, Left Hand Brewery, Dockedly, Downtown Longmont, High Plains Bank, Handprint Inc., Circle Graphics, Sticker Giant, and Chop 5. We appreciate you all so very much in helping to make this possible. So every night after our uh, full day lineup, we have some amazing events uh, throughout Longmont. Uh, and tonight is no different. We have a kickoff event at Wibby uh, Brewery with live music. Um, they're at 209 Emory Street here in Longmont and starting at four o'clock uh, up through about eight o'clock, we've got three bands. So four to 515, Aaron Wardle. Um, he's with Francis and the Wolf. Uh, uh, they're playing 530 to six, St. James the Lesser and 615 to seven, band from flight. Uh, so if you like great brews, um, great music and an opportunity to hang out with great friends you come on down and, and join us. So thanks for the first session uh, joining us uh, on Monday. Uh, again, Monday through Friday, we have these lined up from nine in the morning to three in the afternoon, and we're really excited to share a day with you. So thank you very much, and we'll see you uh, at the top of the hour.